morning and welcome to Higher Ground, an examination of some of today's moral and ethical issues. I'm your host, Carmen Fields. Under what circumstances is violence an acceptable behavior in general, in, a life, in the life of a Christian in particular? Are there exceptions to rules of nonviolence? What about for war? What about for employment in places that manufacture weapons, military machinery, and the like? What about the death penalty? My guest today believes churches and their leaders are running from the nonviolent Jesus and his nonviolent way. His book is called, All Things Flee Thee, For Thou Fleest Me. Reverend Emmanuel Charles McCarthy is a priest of the Eastern Rite Byzantine of the Catholic Church. He is presently acting rector of St. Gregory the Theologian Byzantine Melkite Catholic Seminary in Roslindale, Massachusetts. He's a former lawyer and university educator and founder of the Program for the Study and Practice of Nonviolent Conflict Resolution at the University of Notre Dame. He has been nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize for his life's work on behalf of genuine peace. I'm honored to welcome you to Higher Ground, Reverend McCarthy. Thank you, Carmen. Glad to be here. Uh, for our audience, first thing, clarify for me what the difference between the Byzantine Catholic Church and the church as uh, we normally think of it. In the Catholic Church, which is the, basically the church under the Pope, mm -hmm. that's what we're talking about, in the Catholic Church, there are, a pro there are 22 different rites or jurisdictions. Mm -hmm. The largest of those rites and jurisdictions is what's called the Roman Rite, which is the right that extends basically from Yugoslavia west across Italy and Europe into the United States. And that's the Roman Catholic Church. But there are other rites. A rite, R-I-T-E, is a way of... Uh, a way of celebrating the worship services, a way of governing your church. There are 21 others. One at the second largest is the Byzantine Rite, there's the Coptic Rite, there's the Malabar Rite, there's the Marianite Rite. These are all east of okay. Rome. Okay. And so I belong to the Byzantine Rite, which is a particular way of saying the Mass and so forth and so on, under the Pope, it's not Orthodox, under the Pope. And the reason these various rites also exist in the United States, as opposed to just where they grew up in, mm -hmm. um, is because we're an immigrant society. Mm -hmm. And people come from the Ukraine, they come from, from Lebanon, etc. And so that's how they're used to worshiping, and that's why the church provides these rites in the United States. But you're born and raised here. How did you find that particular right, uh, as opposed to the parishes in, in Dorchester or, or, or other places? By the grace of God. <laughs> <laughs> no, back in 1958, Cardinal Cushing, knowing that there was a, a relatively large uh, Russian Catholic community, which was Byzantine, in the general Boston area, uh, sent a man, a priest by the name of John Moet, over to Rome to study Russian in the Byzantine Rite. And he came back and he began celebrating the liturgy and the mass and the worship services at St. Clement's Eucharistic Shrine, 1958, uh, in the Byzantine Rite. Then Cardinal Cushing gave them a downstairs at St. Vincent's Church in South Boston where they set up a beautiful Byzantine church and we moved in there on January 6th of 1960. And so I just found it to be a, uh, a more palatable, uh, a spiritually um, better place for me to be. And so while I was born and brought up Roman Catholic, I just switched over to that right. Any Catholic can do that, but that's how it came about, uh, Carmen. Okay, well you say that seminaries fail in the teaching of Christian nonviolence. How so? What, um, what do you mean by that? Well, uh, in terms of just the best and normal uh, consensus biblical scholarship today, whether you're talking about Catholics or Protestants or Orthodox or Jewish biblical scholars, uh, there's no doubt that the Jesus of the New Testament is nonviolent, taught a way of nonviolent love of friends and enemies, not only by his words, but by his deeds right up until his death. 
Yet since the time of Constantine, which is approximately the fourth century, the church has all but ignored that teaching of Jesus and replaced it with a whole series of theological theories on justified homicidal violence, justified war, justified capital punishment, ju uh, and of course right into justified torture in terms of the Inquisition and so forth and so on. So the vast majority of Christian seminaries today are heirs not to Jesus' teaching in their, in their practical operation and what they teach in morals and ethics. They fundamentally focus on, whether they're Catholic, Protestant, or Orthodox, they fundly, fundamentally focus on the justified violence tradition of the last 1,700 years, not the nonviolent tradition of Christianity for the first 300 years. Uh, well, who taught you or brought you to this uh, your understanding of the nonviolent Jesus? Well, when I went, after I went through um, 16 consecutive years of Catholic education from grammar school through graduating from the University of Notre Dame, uh, I raised my hand and joined the Marine Corps. Nonviolence was a non thought. We're talking early 1960s at mm -hmm. this point. Nonviolence was a non thought. It never occurred to me. Uh, there was some vague mention of pacifists in terms of being Quakers, but in my world they were considered wimps and unpatriotic. I would say that the, the person that opened my mind to the possibility, I mean just, just the possibility, not any, any, any certainty, but just opened it to possibly consider the thought was Martin Luther King Jr. And he opened it up because Really, not so much uh, in, in, in terms of any of the depth of his writings, I never read them uh, at that point, but he, simply because he was stating with such conviction, this is the way Christians do things. And it, the over and over and over again presentation of it finally somehow got into my conscience, and I began to think, is, could he possibly be right? Then I came across Catholic people saying the same thing, like Dorothy Day, Thomas Merton, mm -hmm. and truth just compelled me to say, this is what Jesus taught, this is his way, uh, regardless of what Christians have been saying for the last 1700 years. Our conversation uh, about the nonviolent Jesus Christ continues after a few messages of interest. Please stay with us. We're back talking about the notion of nonviolent Christian life with Reverend Emmanuel Charles McCarthy, the author of All Things Flee Thee, Thou Fle For Thou Fleest Me. Tell me about that title. What does it mean and what's the overall goal of the book? Well, uh, Carmen, the, the great question that's placed before Christianity, Catholic, Protestant, Orthodox, Evangelical, is if Jesus is God, if Jesus is risen from the dead, if Jesus is the Redeemer, why doesn't the world look more redeemed 2,000 years from now? Good After question, his, yes. It is a good, <laughs> solid question. Huh? Yeah. And, and, of course, the credibility of the church, of, of Jesus himself, relies on it. And my experience is that uh, the Christian religions, the various forms, Catholic, Protestant, Orthodox, Evangelical, they've all come up with uh, rather whimsical theological suggestions as to why nothing has changed in 2,000 years. Um, in the Catholic tradition, we have that famous quote by Chesterton where he says, when presented with this question, well, it's not that Christianity has been tried and failed, it's that Christianity has been found too difficult and not tried. <laughs> ha ha. Well, it's not a ha ha. Because we're living in a furnace of agony on this planet right at this second and for every second before this. The level of misery is incomprehensible that people are living in. It's not a ha-ha matter. If mm -hmm. Jesus is the Redeemer, he's the Redeemer of evil as manifest in all its forms. Death, suffering of all forms, oppression, um, the ugliness of the hearts. That, you know. And so, what really seems to me to be the case is this. 
It's not that God doesn't want to improve the human situation. God sends his son, Jesus, to teach us how. What is happening is that since we do not want to enter into the way that he laid out as the way to overcome evil and death, evil and death are not overcome. And by we, I mean those people who were chosen to follow that way, who are not Muslims, not Jews, but Christians. Christianity has by this time created a religion of loopholes from the gospel. And those loopholes, they are like short circuits in the power of God to act through the church. Mm -hmm. And so all things flee thee, for thou fleest me. That comes from the, from the Thompson poem called The Hound of Heaven, where the man is just running down highways and byways trying to avoid the destiny God gave him, but God pursues him, as God is pursuing the various churches today and saying, come back, do it the way I said, and wonderful things will happen. Continue to do it the way I, 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 that I told you not to, and you're going to continue to engage in your justified religious fratricide, which is nothing but evil. When we think of nonviolence, two names immediately come to mind. You, you mentioned one, Martin Luther King, um, also Gandhi. Are there modern proponents or practitioners of this mode of Christianity or what you refer to as the nonviolent Jesus, uh, and how is it, it manifest today? It seems to me that it seems to me that uh, when Martin Luther King and Gandhi were talking about nonviolence, they talked about it on a popular level, but they also talked and wrote about it at the most sophisticated level that anyone would ever be able to examine it at. And they acted and talked consistently with their various levels of understanding of what the word means. Today, nonviolence in the ordinary American mind is reduced to civil disobedience. And when it's not reduced to that, it's reduced to some kind of a utopian, uh, impractical kind of thing that idealists use. It's a word so wide open in terms of its definition that it has almost no meaning. And of course, it can always be dragged out when, uh, when you want to demean someone. So, in terms of modern practitioners, there are probably more people today than since the first three centuries, certainly Christians, that identify themselves in terms of the nonviolence of Jesus than ever before. However, the identification, from, in my experience, is quite superficial. They sense the truth of it, they sense that's what's there in the gospel, but they haven't and the churches have not helped them, I guarantee that, have not helped them to understand the implications of what that means from the violence of the tongue to the violence of the gun. What that means incarnationally, what that calls you to indeed. So in terms of the heart being there, more people have the heart for it, I'm sure, than ever before. Deeds, that's a different story. Well, what, what are the deeds? What does it call us to, those of us who profess to be Christians. What is the calling of, uh, in following the nonviolent Jesus? I think over and above all else, it calls us to understand God differently than God is understood in any other religion in the world. Jesus comes along at a time when the Jewish people referred to God, not even by his name, Yahweh, but had another name, Adonai, Adonai, as we say in English, because the holy name was so sacred. God was so far away. God was so transcendent. And Jesus comes along, and he calls God Abba, which we translate wrongly, Father. It could just as easily be Mother. The idea is that it is the unconditionally loving parent, not just of all humanity, but of each of every, every one. And he says, God is the Father of all, in all, for all, and above all. Not just the father of Israel, not just the father of the Jews, not just his father. God creates each and every one and loves each and every one infinitely. Right at the heart of nonviolence 
is a different understanding of God and hence a different understanding of what a human being is. God loves and values each and every human being infinitely. And what God loves and values infinitely, no human being has the right to relate to that person in any, any other way, let alone destroy. And so it is in this building of a new consciousness that God indeed loves me, that's not an issue, but that God not only loves me infinitely, he loves the guy on my right and the gal on my left infinitely also. And that calls for a different understanding of what's right, what's wrong, and how to relate. In a word, it calls, it calls to us to respond to people since we are made in the image of God as God responds to them. And that depends upon how we see God. And if we see God as the loving parent of each and every one, then a parent does not kill his or her child. We'll be right back uh, for our final segment. We're back with the Reverend Emmanuel Charles McCarthy. Your focus is on the nonviolent Jesus. What about other religious traditions, Judaism, Islam, is there, I guess, a counterpart or this uh, theme of nonviolence in other religious traditions? Well, I think in, in uh, all reasonableness, uh, we would have to let folks who actually live those traditions answer that. But what I can say objectively huh, is that as people who are Christian, who say they are followers of Jesus, have to break with the founder if they are going to justify violence in the name of God, Christians, so also it seems to me in Islam and Judaism, anyone who would propose nonviolence would have to break with the founder. Because both Moses and Muhammad are quite clear in the use of violence, indeed homicidal violence, um, in terms of what they understood to be the revelation of God. So if there is a nonviolent component to Islam, to Judaism, uh, Hinduism, it would, it would have to be a component that would have to make some kind of break with the fundamental revelation, the same kind of break that <clears throat> most of the Christian churches have made with the fundamental revelation in Jesus, except the other way around. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, why don't the churches teach the gospel of a nonviolent Jesus, do you think? I think they don't teach it, uh, first of all, out of habit of not teaching it. Uh, if you do not nurture children in this, children grow up not nurtured in it, they become ministers and priests and so forth and bishops, and their worldview, their ethos, is just a non-thinking, as I was, non-violence is a non-thought. But the other side of that is something more profound, and that is, I wonder if the problem in the Christian churches, whether it be Catholic, Protestant, Orthodox, Evangelical, I wonder if the problem is not something that we might call Christian agnosticism or Christian atheism. That is, people will trust Jesus on the deathbed, but not before that time. But you see, if Jesus is God, Jesus gets absolute trust. And so, the approach should be, we follow, we are faithful to Jesus and we don't worry about institutional survival or personal survival. He takes care of that, we take care of the fidelity. But what has happened, of course, in the churches, whether it's Catholic, Protestant, Orthodox, Evangelical, what is presented is, you take care of number one first, your group, your, you know, and hence, then, we'll rely on Jesus. The reality of what that has produced is, it has produced Christian religions of various forms, Catholic, Protestant, Orthodox, who have become nothing more than religious cheerleaders for the home team homicide when the home team has gone to war or whatever. We could go on and on. I'm sorry that our time has, has been so short together. Thank you very much for being with us. And for those of you who want some more information or materials about the work of uh, Reverend McCarthy, you can write to or email the following number or telephone the following number. It's the Center for Christian Nonviolence, area code 302 
and the email address is j j c a r m o d y at comcast.net and that is it for this edition of higher ground i want to thank you all uh, for being with us and my guest on this very wonderful and special journey uh, we will end by um, uh, the words of Ralph Waldo Emerson, you can never do a kindness too soon because you never know when it will be too late.